Well, it is getting to be one o'clock. Um, so it gets to be my pleasure to uh, introduce Jay McTie. Jay is going to be doing three sessions for us spread over the next uh, few weeks uh, on backwards design. And we are fortunate to go to the man who wrote the book. Um, so he is one of the authors of Understanding by Design. Um, and Kathy Bataro and I uh, are just so very excited that he can be here with us. So Jay, our time is short, so I'm going to turn things over to you. Uh, great. Thank you, Susan. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, I once had a, a, a job when we would have mandatory trainings, and my boss all, always called them required opportunities. So I got the impression that this may be uh, such for you. Uh, if so, though, by, I hope by the end of this hour, you will have felt it was interesting or at least a, a good use of your time, and, and that's my hope. Uh, I'm going to share my volunteer army here, Jay. All volunteers. Oh, okay. Then I retract my opening statement. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just double check if you can see my screen, full screen now. Okay. Yes. So as Susan said, I, I did have the honor of working with my colleague Grant Wiggins on a book. Uh, it's been around for quite a while now. It's entitled Understanding by Design, and it's really a curriculum development framework that's been used not only in K to 12, but it is being used in college and universities for course design. And so I've been asked to share with you some ideas from our book toward that topic. So um, as Susan mentioned, this is actually part one of a three-part series. Each will be about an hour in length. Um, and so in this session, I'm gonna focus briefly on the big ideas of this curriculum framework and then focus on what I call stage one of backward design, which is really framing course goals, but there are a few nuances that I wanna share with you. Our second session, which will be, I think a week from now, uh, will focus on assessment evidence. And the logic of backward design is pretty clear. If, if, we're, agree, if we're clear on the priorities of our learning goals for a course, then we think about, well, what evidence will show that students have learned the material, developed whatever skills are involved, and have conceptual understandings around the important ideas in the course. And so we'll be exploring assessment practices in, in session two. And the third session really focuses on instruction and teaching. And one of my contentions is that understanding must be earned. It must be earned by the student. And that's more than just taking notes about what a professor or instructor says. So I'm gonna engage or, or share with you some strategies which I think are effective for engaging students in what I call making meaning of course content such that they earn understanding. And that's different than rote learning where they memorize and give back. So those are the three sessions, but I'll be focusing uh, on session one. Now, even though our time is short, I, I'm committed to making uh, learning hopefully interesting and engaging. And one way we'll try to do that is through uh, several times we'll have uh, an opportunity for you to meet with colleagues in meeting rooms. And I believe um, meeting rooms have been set up. I think uh, we'll probably have three opportunities for about five minutes each. But during the meeting room time, it's a, share, a chance for you to just converse with other faculty members, some of whom you may know, others you may meet online, uh, it's a chance for you to summarize what for you are key ideas from what you've heard, add your own thoughts. How does this relate to your work or your course design or what ideas come to mind? And if there are questions that come up from something I say or some of the examples, you might bring your questions up within your group and hear responses from colleagues. So the, the intention is to give you a chance for some active processing of information um, rather than just listening to me talk at you for an hour via screen. Um, I have a little teacher bell here. So at the end of five minutes or so, I'll, I'll ring the bell, but I think somebody will probably be monitoring the, the meeting rooms as well and give us a, a one minute warning. Open invitation. If you have questions that come to you from some of the presentation and you want to uh, feel free to drop them in the chat box at any time. Um, if I see a question in the chat, which I'll be monitoring, I may, I may respond right away, but more, more than likely I'll hold off, A, because I might be knowing I'll get to it a bit later, or I might wait until after the meeting room and then I'll, I'll look at questions. But uh, you're invited to uh, pose questions if you have some. Um, 
I believe you can access, uh, whether you have it now or you, you can, um, just a, a summary of, of some of the slides I'm showing. Um, I, I shared those with Susan, uh, along with a, a short article that describes the ideas of understanding by design. So that's a resource for you. So let me start with the big ideas of understanding by design. As mentioned, this is basically a curriculum or course planning framework, and its key ideas are in its title. My longstanding content, contention should be um, the focus of teaching and learning should be to develop deep learning, i.e. we want the students to really understand important ideas and processes in the courses we teach. And ultimately, preparing students to transfer, to be able to apply what they've learned, not just in a rote mechanical way, but they can use it in real life situations and in new situations, which they may not have seen before. In other words, if, if they understand material enough, they can apply and, and transfer. And I suspect and would hope that that is among your goals uh, as a teacher in your school, your university. The second big idea is by design. And this is where, as Susan referenced, we use a quote backward design model for planning courses. Um, backward design is certainly not a new idea. We didn't invent it but it has proven to be a popular but also effective way of designing courses, uh, or in the case of K to 12, units of study within courses. So those are the two big ideas in understanding by design. Now, again, this is not a new idea and many of you I suspect are familiar with it, but permit me to articulate the way Grant Wiggins and I have operationalized this design process. Again, we propose there are three stages, we call them in backward design, starting with goals. What are your learning goals or the desired results for you as a teacher in the courses you teach? And you, know, you might think, well, well, duh, of course, anyone planning anything ought to have goals or results in mind. Well, true, but you'll see in a moment, if you don't already know, there's some particular ways that we recommend thinking about course goals. Stage two is in many ways at the heart of this process. In stage two, we're asked to think like assessors and ask a straightforward question. If these are the course goals, this is what we want students to learn, what evidence of learning, skill proficiency, and understanding do we need? And we think about the assessment evidence before we get too invested in actually planning the details of our courses, developing, the week by week or day by day uh, lessons, our, our presentations, um, what we're gonna have students do, homework assignments, et cetera. All the guts of, of planning occur in stage three. But my contention is the learning plan we carve out in stage three is enhanced when we're not only clear but have prioritized the content in our courses and I argue we should prioritize on big ideas that we want students to really understand. And also when we thought about the kind of evidence we need for those goals. The ideas of backward design aren't new and they were articulated uh, in 1949, the year of my birth by Dr. Ralph Tyler at the University of Chicago, where he wrote a classic book on course design and he posed it around, framed it around three questions, which are on the screen. So you might look at this and say, well, duh, isn't this obvious? Well, perhaps, but my experience is not always. I can tell you from my teaching experience, which included K to 12 and university, in my early days of teaching, I didn't plan this way. I had a general idea of desired results, but quite, quite frankly, they were often dictated by the textbooks I used. You know, I would just, the chapter objectives would be my, my design and I would march through the, the textbook chapter by chapter. And then when I planned, I planned my teaching. And even as a beginning teacher, I tried to get outside the textbook, tried to make lessons that were interesting. I was also, always interested in engaging student thinking. So I would pose you know, challenging questions or use a discrepant event or, or put, an issue, put forth an issue that I know would generate some discussion. 
Um, and I, I did what I thought was, was interesting and engaging for kids. But when I started teaching, it was before the days of the internet. And it was hard to find really good ideas. I had to make up a lot. And quite frankly, some of them were engaging in that students were actively involved, but they weren't always pointed toward my objectives. You know, they were, they were interesting in their own right, but not purposeful in other words. And when I thought of assessment, I thought assessment was something you did periodically, essentially giving a test to get a grade and that you could average all the grades at the end for a final uh, grade. So that's just how I thought you did it. If you had told me back in the day that I should think about my assessments, actually plan my assessments before I plan my teaching, I would have said, well, that's backward. You know, how can you test things you hadn't taught? And how do you know it's appropriate to test until you taught it? And by the way, I started teaching in the 70s and we wanted to be kind of loose and go with the flow. So we didn't want to be too tight after all. So um, I didn't use backward design as my point here um, until many years later. Ironically, I was a coach. And in coaching, I used backward design just naturally, never even thought about it. That's just what you did in coaching. Coaching with the end in mind and you're planning backward uh, working on what the players needed for the game. But I didn't transfer the ideas to my teaching until many years later. But now I, I'm here to say backward design is, is a really powerful planning construct. And if you don't already do it, but you learn it and try it, I don't think you'll ever go back. We have a planning template that we developed in Understanding by Design, and it basically is a graphic organizer that outlines the elements of UBD, and it serves as a template for course design. Um, now, some people see a template and they don't like them. You know, one person said to me, I don't like to put my ideas in boxes. And my reply, don't put them in boxes then. It's not about the boxes. Backward design is a way of thinking, a way of prioritizing the curriculum and ensuring that we have evidence for all of our goals, not just the things that are easy to test and grade. So I'm a fan of the template. As one teacher said to me, after I used this a couple of times, it became a mental template. Really, it's a way of thinking. Now, um, your university has put together a version of this, uh, a, a backward design planning template with some key points for you to consider. So. Um, that's out there. And, and again, I think this just makes sense. It's, it's just good planning. Now, what I want to do um, in our time available is to push a little bit into some of the nuances of understanding by design. And I'm going to focus just on stage one. And that's where we think about uh, course goals and desired learning results. So let us have a look um, at some ideas here. I'm going to present some ideas and then pause for the meeting room so you'll have a chance to you know, exchange thoughts with colleagues. So over the years, uh, Grant Wiggins and I have written about the fact that there are, there are different goal types in learning. And three categories of goal types are on the screen. And again, these aren't new, but, but I think it's important to think about these uh, carefully. Um, on the upper left side, we have uh, goals that I call acquisition goals. As a question, what knowledge and skills do we want students to acquire in this course? And virtually every course I'm aware of, there's a lot of potential content, things that kids should know, students should know. And in some courses, there are, are skills that they have to develop in practice. So that's pretty, pretty uh, standard and I would say foundational. In every course, there's foundational knowledge and skills, and you can't do anything without the basics or without those foundational elements. But I'd also contend that beyond knowledge and skills to be acquired, there are what I call understanding goals. Understanding refers to the quote, bigger ideas, the, the, the more abstract concepts and principles, LES, within a discipline, as well as the processes that are in the discipline. And we want more than just memorization or rote learning of these. We want students to come to understand them. And ultimately, and arguably, the most, I think, important goal of most courses is transfer. In other words, can students take what they've learned and apply it effectively, and including in a new situation that wasn't taught to them? 
because as you well know, in most of your courses, you're preparing kids, particularly in the medical uh, arena, uh, dealing with unknowns sometimes. Not everything can be looked up and not everything is formulaic. Do students understand enough that they can adapt and, and, and apply their learning as new challenges uh, uh, confront them? So these are three interrelated goals for learning. And my contention is, as we plan cor a course, we want to be clear about all three because they're not identical. The worthiness of the distinctions to me has to do, number one, with how people learn these things. If I want you to remember something, how do I teach for that? Well, I can give you a mnemonic. I can have you write it 10 times. Uh, I can have you try to use it. Um, I can have you do flashcards. <laughs> That will help you remember. But understanding and transfer to me call for different teaching methods. In fact, my contention is you can't just give a student an understanding by telling them. Right? Correlation does not ensure causality. Write that down. That's a big idea. And that doesn't ensure that students are going to immediately grasp it, just if you say it even carefully. Um, and so how we learn these things is not identical. And similarly, the assessment evidence for these goals is not the same. If I wanna see if you know something, I can give you an objective test or quiz, multiple choice, run it through a Scantron, I can see percentage correct. And that's an appropriate assessment of knowledge. If I wanna see if you are skilled with a, 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 or proficient in a skill, or you can actually apply a process, what's the best assessment? In most cases, it's watching the student perform the skill or apply the process. And that's a more performance-based assessment. And my contention is that understanding and transfer requires particular kind of evidence. And I'll be getting into that in the, in the next session. So suffice it to say, when we plan units using the UBD framework, we're asking professors, instructors, uh, teachers, to think about all three goals. What knowledge and skills are critical for students to acquire in this course? What are the larger conceptual understandings you really want them to leave with? And what are you hoping they can do with their learning? And what evidence will we be looking for to see if they can transfer? Those are the three goal types that we recommend. Now, for illustrative purposes, um, permit me to engage you in a, in a short exercise. And I'm gonna pick an exercise in which these three goal types I think are revealed in an interesting way, but it's always challenging presenting to um, a group of faculty that have very different backgrounds and teach different courses from different disciplines. But I think I've picked a topic that everyone can relate to and um, we're gonna use that in a little exercise. And the topic I'm, I've picked is driving or more specifically learning to drive. By the way, are any of you in, as parents in that learning to drive mode? You have kids in that? <laughs> I see Melissa is one. Well, we empathize. So let's think about learning to drive. I'm gonna ask you three questions and I'm gonna ask you to think about the first, but I would ask you for the second question, enter your thoughts into the, into the, the uh, chat box. I'd like to see everybody just respond to the second question. And there'll be three questions, but number two is for you to respond to. Okay, so, but think about the first one. Here it goes. I'm gonna come back to this. Oops. All right, so the first question, what are some things that a beginning driver will need to know? And what are some of the, skill, of the skills they'll need to practice before we're ready to get them even provisionally behind a wheel? You don't have to think about a detailed list, but just a few examples of knowledge and skills needed for a beginning driver. Okay, here's question number two. I want to keep that brief, but number two is the one I want everyone to respond to. So have a look at this one. This to me is an interesting one. Oops. 
what do we want a beginning driver to come to understand about driving? What are the important things? Um, and one way of thinking about this is what does a good or an effective driver understand that a beginner or just a bad driver doesn't? And I also want to distinguish between knowledge and understanding. Knowledge would be things like rules of the road or the meaning of signs and symbols on the highway or what the different knobs and levers on a car do. That's knowledge. But, but understanding are more conceptual. Um, so I see a lot of people are adding. So go ahead, put in one or more ideas. What are some things that you would want a beginning driver to come to understand? Oh, the wonderful, a wonderful set of understandings are unfolding. And after you've entered yours, just scroll up and down the chat box. You can see what people have responded to. All right, these are great. Let me leave you with a third question. You can respond in writing if you wish, otherwise think about it. Here's a third and final question for this exercise. What's the ultimate or the long-term goal of a society that teaches people to drive and grants them a license to drive? I framed it as a long-term goal because I want to distinguish the goal of a society from the goal of the 16-year-old uh, kid. Because often the kid has a short-term goal, right? They want to pass a driver test, get that license, get those keys, get away from mom and dad, hang out with their friends, have freedom. That's a short-term goal. But our societal goal is broader in scope. And if you think about it, we're licensing young people whose prefrontal cortexes have not fully matured to drive a lethal weapon. So um, that's my third question. And a lot of you are putting in uh, your comments now, so go for it. So thank, thanks for playing along. Keep entering if you're, if you're still typing. Um, but thanks for playing along with the exercise. And I hope the exercise was both interesting, but, but it makes a point. Let me unpack the exercise. If we were using the understanding by design planning template to plan a driver's training course, it would look something like this. Remember, one goal category has to do with knowledge and skills we want students to acquire. So there's some things on the left side that go in the, the heading of knowledge. And many of you noted those. You need to know the rules and regulations for driving in, in Texas, the meaning of traffic signs and signals, basic car parts and what they do, what to do in case of an accident. That's an important thing a beginner should know. And we could list others. On the skill side, there are lots of skills that have to be practiced, right? Everything from adjusting the mirrors in the seat before you even turn on the car, to make sure you can see and are comfortable. And then other things like coordinating the accelerator with the brakes, so you're not lurching, uh, merging into traffic, parking in the city, unless you have a self-parking car, et cetera. So there are a lot of skills here. As in every course, every course you teach, there's clearly lots of knowledge and skills, and we, we need to teach those for kids can learn them, students can learn them. Now, look at some of the understandings these are in line with ones that, that you see in the chat box. In fact, there's some great ones that I might borrow in the future. Um, one was a physics, uh, you can't go faster than the car ahead of you. Uh, or you control your car, but not the car, of, but not other people. But those are examples. Um, here are a few that Grant Wiggins and I put in. You're driving 
essentially a lethal weapon. And so constant attention is required. A moment's hesitation or inattention can end your life or ruin someone else's. Another quote, big idea is defensive driving. The beginner thinks if they're careful and, and practiced and attentive, everything is fine until they realize they're sharing the road with idiots or people that will do unexpected or, or dangerous things. So it's not just about you, you have to be constantly defensive. That's a conceptual idea. It's more than a fact and it takes time to develop that understanding. Another big idea is adaptation. One size fits all driving is dangerous or can be. If you're having hail storms in Texas or in black ice in Maryland, um, you got to adjust your speed. Similarly, uh, during rush hour, um, et cetera. And that's an understanding that people need to come to. Another one for young people, if you don't take care of your car, it may not take care of you. You might be inclined to skip the annual brake inspection because it costs $15 until your brakes fail. So these are examples of conceptual understandings. They're, they're different, qualitatively different than just knowledge and, and skills, and yet they're important. Now in understanding by design, we also use what we call essential questions. Questions that are used to frame desired understandings, but also questions meant to engage the learner in coming to an understanding. In other words, by exploring these questions over time, the goal is to develop and deepen understanding. So you can see a couple of essential questions that I believe we'd use for an entire driver training course. What does it mean to be responsible behind the wheel? Or even more generally, um, as an automobile driver? What does it mean to be defensive? And how do we do it? How and when should I adapt my driving? These are important questions and they get to and relate to our desired understandings. The final question I asked you for me is a transfer question. It's, it's asking us to think about in the long run, as we're working on planning, <laughs> preparing drivers, what is our ultimate hope when they leave us? We wanna prepare drivers that are responsible, defensive, adaptable, and courteous, we hope. And you had some other examples of transfer goals that even went to the larger society, you know, offering opportunity to people and, you know, enabling uh, our economy to work well would be broader examples. So these are the three goal categories, the goal types that we recommend in understanding by design. And my recommendation is you're planning courses. You could list course objectives that could include different types, but I actually think there's value in articulating the differences and actually framing the course with these types of categories and even presenting them to students. Otherwise, everything could be seen as facts and taught and learned and assessed in that way. But we know that, that factual learning is not the only goal type. Here is another point that I wanna make before we have a meeting room pause. Every course you teach, I suspect, has way too much potential content and more time than you have. So every teacher has to focus and prioritize the course. And if you're not careful, you can get lost in the weeds of just trying to cover lots of stuff, but the result could be superficial learning versus understanding and deep learning. So understanding by design in large part is intended to help us focus and prioritize our teaching. So I wanted to bring that into the mix. If the goal is safe, courteous, and adaptable driving, students don't need to memorize all the car parts. If, however, the goal is auto mechanics, this knowledge rises significantly in importance. Keeping the end in mind is, is a phrase that says, let's make sure we're clear about our priorities and plan accordingly. All right, thanks for playing along with the exercise. Uh, I'm not sure who's gonna initiate this, but I think someone, Melissa, is going to put us in breakout rooms. This is a chance for you to just compare notes and share your thoughts.
and we have a five minute time period for this, Melissa, if you could keep track of that. So I think you can all join a group and carry on. And I will be right back. Kathy, are you there? I am. I have a breakout room asking for my help. According to the instructions, the Zoom recording would continue recording this main area as long as I was here. So I'm not really sure what's going to happen with that. I'm going to just jump over and find out. Okay. I think what you may, you may have to restart the recording if it cuts off. Okay, okay. I've Perfect. seen that before, but I'm, I'm not sure. If you're, uh, so give it a try. We'll see. Okay, thanks. You were right. It just asked me if I wanted to continue, and I did. Uh, all right, perfect. So if you, I don't if, if I think you can give a one minute warning. You, okay, perfect. Thanks, Melissa. I had to run out and get my timer because I want to make sure I'm on time. So uh, I'm going to join groups the next uh, time or two. I think we'll have time for two more. And Melissa, you can let me know when most people are back.
you are ready to go. Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with colleagues. And I'm gonna proceed because there, there are two more specific ideas I wanna share with you um, in conjunction with thinking about course design. Uh, but before so doing, uh, here's an understanding about driving from the comedian George Carlin. And uh, here's a cartoonist that renders the same idea visually. So uh, just for fun. So now back to the serious stuff. Um, you may have come across the name Dr. John Hattie, H-A-T-T-I-E. John uh, is an educational researcher. He's from New Zealand. He's has spent his entire career, 35 plus years, studying, teaching, and learning in K-12 university and industrial training kind of set settings. He's written an interesting book called Visible Learning in which he has done through meta-analyses, he's put what he calls effect sizes on different teaching techniques and approaches. Um, I've gotten to know John um, and a couple of years ago, he sent me an article and he said, you're gonna like this Jay, because it relates to your work on understanding by design. Here is Hattie's words with my graphic. Hattie said, in all my years studying teaching and learning, I've concluded that we can think about three levels of learning. He said there's surface level learning, typified when teachers present information to students or they read it in a book or they view it online. He said, but if they don't do anything with the information or if they don't engage with it, other than maybe writing it down, um, it's going to remain superficial. They may remember it long enough to pass a test, but often if they don't do something with it, it will fade away. And then John said there's deep learning which he defines as I do as learning for understanding or with understanding. And John said the deepest learning prepares students to transfer. They understand sufficiently that they can apply to other things. So this is one of the prominent researchers in our profession, highlighting uh, some of the points that, that understanding by design has made for many years. So this to me says, when we're planning courses, while there's a lot of content to cover, unquestionably too much in most cases, I still argue that we should focus on a smaller number of big ideas to teach for understanding, even as kids, students are acquiring lots of, of other information. And so this suggests that we wanna make sure that we're focusing on the larger ideas of our courses and not just covering lots of stuff because we could get lost in the car parts and miss the ideas like defensive and adaptable driving. So when I talk about a big idea, hopefully it, it makes sense. We're talking about a more abstract idea than just a fact, typically a concept, a theme, a principle, LE, and, a, and or a process. And if you think about it, Facts don't transfer, although they're important, but concepts, processes do. Another virtue that we know from learning research that when students understand a larger concept, they're able to connect new information to it. As a friend of mine said, the concepts provide conceptual Velcro. They help new information cohere. Check out this animation that attempts to make the point visually. Failure to have larger ideas or concepts to hang on to, just being bombarded with lots of information and no chance to do anything with it results in the problem depicted in the cartoon. And while the cartoon is picked on mathematics, we could put any, any course title on the door. 
The psychologists refer to this as inert knowledge. It was taken in, but it was never really used. There was no active meaning making. It was never understood and it quickly fell away. It didn't endure. There are a number of, of little tools that, that we use in understanding by design, but I'll, I'll share um, one with you now and one after the next pause. But this is a simple but interesting uh, little framework and see, see if you agree. If you look at all of the content that might be taught in a course, and there's typically too much, this is a prioritizing frame with these three ovals. You could distinguish the nice to know Maybe it's an interesting story or a bit of history or an interesting factoid from the important to know. This is where the basic skills and foundational um, information reside. And then in the center are the small number of really the big ideas, the concepts that are most worth understanding. And Grant Wiggins and I've used the phrase enduring understanding to convey the idea that not everything is going to last, but what's most enduring? You know, 10 years from now, do you want the student to really understand and be able to do, um, even if they forget some of the details? So it's interesting to just put this lens on all the possible content and use it to kind of filter out, or at least to, to prioritize the most important items. It's also really interesting, and if you have occasion, I would recommend this, do this with a colleague, or do this with a departmental team. I think that's a good use of department meeting time. Let everybody put out their courses and, and, and prioritize and make the case for why this is most important. Also, how this links to other courses in your program. So there's coherence, not only within an individual course, but in a collective, um, a collection of courses. So anyway, that's just a, a little tool. There's other, research from cognitive psychology that underscores these points. Uh, this is just one, one, one example. So we know the whole chunking concept in memory and the idea that experts, one of the the, the reasons they have expertise, as you do in your field, is that you understand the big ideas and you're able to organize information, find it quickly. But when you encounter new information, you've got conceptual buckets to put it in for the most part, unless it's completely uh, out of the box. It's a, a new paradigm, for instance. Um, but beginners don't have this. So part of what we're trying to do by focusing on big ideas is to give them those conceptual buckets and help them see how individual pieces uh, fit in. Now, permit me to share a personal example with you. Um, uh, and it's based on one of the teaching techniques we've described in our book, Teaching for Deeper Learning. It's not a new idea, and I, I'm sure some of you have used this. The idea though is a concept map developed by Dr. Joseph Novak, uh, a scientist and science educator. Um, and he, he used, the concept map as an advanced organizer. In other words, he would plan or prepare concept maps for his courses. And let me show you an example and I'm gonna tell you my personal story. Uh, in graduate school, I took um, two statistics courses that were required, uh, you know, statistics 101 and, and 201. Um, but nobody ever, gave me a concept map like the one that's on the screen. And boy, I wish they had. We just marched through the statistics textbook. It was the same textbook for both courses. It just kept going. And, and I remember memorizing the formulas and I learned about range, variance, distribution, mean, median, and mode. But I just quite, quite frankly didn't understand it very well. Wasn't sure why why, what this formula really stood for or why we were doing it. Now, maybe I was just a bad student, but I, um, I just didn't get it. Um, and then the second course was inferential statistics and I, I learned some of the concepts, but I just never, I left that, those courses not equipped 
to really understand, much less use statistics in any realistic way. And then later on in my, in my career, uh, someone showed me this concept map and I went, whoa, because I, 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 it all came together for me. I said, now I get it. The first course was descriptive statistics. And I was learning how to use data and samples from a population to describe phenomena. And there were measures of central tendency that were descriptive. And my second course was inferential statistics, where I was essentially getting at the predictive capacity, uh, degrees of confidence, uh, correlational factors. Um, and it literally, I, I got this aha. And I wanted to write to my statistics professor and say, please use this in the future. Now, again, maybe I didn't do a good, maybe I just wasn't a good student, but I, I firmly believe that if, if the course had begun by kind of mapping out the big ideas using a concept map, and like the mall signs that you are here, if I, I had been, I could see where we're going in each of the different classes, um, I, I think it would have helped me a lot. And I suspect other students. So this is just one teaching tool that gets at some of the ideas that I'm, I'm sharing with you. All right, I wanna have another pause and give you a chance to react to what you've heard, but also talk about your own teaching and some of the things that you've heard from me. How does it apply in your planning or your teaching? So let's have another pause, please. They're headed over into their rooms and I made you a co-host so you can join any to go talk. Great, I'm gonna join this time. In about five minutes also, please. Sitting there, I'm just, I have to drive to pick up my son, so I didn't want to be silent in the meeting room. No problem. But, you know, but my answer to the questions really is, if a complex system of learning and spaces and situations in which learning has to take place, the classroom, so by being able to be very clear about the questions at stake, and the processes that are going to actually get you to that desired outcome. So, you know, big ideas. I think his picture of the car parts broken off into, you know, all sorts of pieces is kind of that. There's so many steps and things that connect together. How are we going to actually put this thing together? So, I mean, I think the big ideas concept is a fairly central one. People are not going to remember, for the most part, anecdotes, data, and small points. Daniel Levinson, who's a neuroscientist, has a book called The Organized Mind. It kind of addresses the same issue and problem, which is we're just overloaded with information and neural fatigue and decision overload and have a hard time thinking about just very simple concepts. So being able to break things down into their biggest possible sort of essence and then breaking parts off of that that are more accessible and understandable. So, I mean, those are the big things that I took away. I feel that. Sorry, you all have to see me, you know, do the, I'm not doing any cool driving positions or anything, but, you know, 
I don't hear any horns honking, so you must be doing it. Right. Yeah. There it is. I just did one. <laughs> They've got about two more minutes. Okay. Well, I'll just mute myself then so I don't look, you know, like I'm, you know, until uh, the room closes, but thanks. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Hello, welcome back everyone. I hope the conversations were interesting and fruitful. Since our time is winding down, I'm gonna jump right into the, the last portion of our session today. Uh, but before I do a little COVID humor, if there's any humor in COVID, uh, this is a short but, but humorous little video clip. So watch carefully, it goes fast. Uh, sorry, but my mask, it's up. Sir, it's over my nose. <laughs> 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 Just a little silliness as we cope. So um, the last idea I wanna share with you in our remaining time is was, was previewed with the driving example. And that is, as we're identifying, quote, the big ideas that we want students to understand, and we're thinking about what we want them to be able to do in, their, in the long run with their learning, we can use what I like to call essential questions to frame our courses or even our overall programs. Now, because I don't, my background is not in, in for the most part, the, the, the nature of the courses at your university, particularly the medical and nursing oriented courses, I'm sorry, I don't have examples, but I will give you examples nonetheless that I hope will be illustrative of the kinds of questions I'm talking about. But here's an interesting way of thinking about essential questions. If the content you teach are answers, what were the questions that led to those answers in the first place? Because if you think about it, the knowledge that we're now imparting at one point wasn't known. And it was through research, questions, a questioning, imagination, trial and error that resulted in knowledge that we now you know, uh, impart. So it's an interesting question. Think about the content as answers. What were the questions that led to those? Because that will get you into the door of what I call essential questions. Let me give you just a few illustrative examples. 
This is for English and literature, but also writing and reading. I call these essential questions because they're not meant to be answered with a single fact. They're meant to be explored over time. And our answers, in fact, often vary as we understand more. Here's some examples for history. By the way, the first one is one of my favorites. Whose story is this? Signals to students that history is his story, but it's also her story. And if we want to really understand the past, we need to be looking and listening to all stories. The second question gets out a big idea that history is interpretation and two people can interpret the same event in very different ways. Thus, we need to be critical viewers of history. I mean, think about January 6. Some people describe it as a tourist, a normal tourist day. Some people claim it was the FBI. Whose story is it? What really happened? The third question gets at the essence of why we study history. What insights can we gain from studying the rebound after the, the 1918 Spanish flu to give us some sense of what our return to normal might be after COVID? Every discipline has such rich, deep, important questions. And I propose we use them to frame out our courses. Now, some can be kind of philosophic and epistemological and maybe too abstract. The, 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 they may be too divorced from the content you have to teach. But I contend that you tell me any course, show me a few big ideas and we could come up with appropriate essential questions. When I hear people say, I've got so much content to cover, my th thought is, no, I think our job is to uncover the content, to help students really understand its import. And one of the ways we do that is through these kinds of questions. As a practical matter, if you are in a room where you, uh, your own classroom for a course, as opposed to your floating, or it's all virtual, um, I would encourage you if you come up with one or two or three essential questions for your courses around your biggest ideas, post them in the room. And if other people use the room and you need to take them down and put them back up and, and introduce the course through these questions. Such questions signal to students that your job is not to be passive receptor and note taker. Your job is to be an active meaning maker to think about uh, and engage in coming to understand important ideas in the course. So those are some ideas that I, I wanted to share with you. Um, we're just about uh, done with our hour, so I don't think we'll have a formal meeting room now, but I would be, um, we're not gonna have another breakout room, but I would be happy to um, engage any questions you might have and including if you have to drop off since our hour is just about up, um, I would uh, be happy to stick around. For any of you who might be uh, interested in this idea, I have a whole book on the concept of essential questions um, and also a, a book that gets into teaching techniques, one of which was concept mapping. And I'm gonna be talking about more of this in session three. So um, there were two quick questions that came in and I wanna highlight them. And then I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Susan for our benediction. <laughs> um, but if anyone wants to stick around and chat, I'm happy to do so. Um, Bonnie made a comment uh, a few points ago about, um, yeah, she said, I had to do a concept map for my dissertation and it was terrifying. That is a use of concept map, partly as an assessment, I would imagine. And, and by the way, it's a very revealing assessment. Have the student map out the course content toward the end of it to show their understanding. What are the, what are the big ideas, the subordinate concepts and how are they linked? 
It's also a great review tool and you could have students create a group concept map and post it. Uh, and you could even give feedback. It's a great review before a final exam. But I imagine Bonnie was terrifying because it caused you to really show what you understood. Jack asks, is Socratic questioning applicable to understanding by design? Absolutely. In fact, the spirit of essential questions is very much in the Socratic uh, manner and the Socratic method. And my co-author of Understanding by Design, Grant Wiggins, went to St. John's College, which as you may know, the entire college is built around Socratic seminars um, and um, Socratic questioning. So Grant was a real expert and he brought that work to Understanding by Design. So um, to Jack and Melissa, absolutely. It is very, uh, very compatible. And in fact, kind of at the heart of, of UBD. It's not the only method we recommend and it works better in some, some courses than others, but the short answer is yes. Um, Michael asks, what book do you recommend? If you are interested in understanding, understanding by design, kind of the, the, the concept from ground up, the book Understanding by Design would be recommended. If you're interested in essential questions as one particular methodology, um, this book. Uh, and if you're interested more in the instructional implications, uh, this book. And if you're interested in assessment, I'll share with you another book uh, next session. So um, I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna turn it back to Susan, but then anybody who wants to hang around, we can unmute and, and keep going if you'd like. So thanks for hanging in there. And uh, Susan, I'll stop talking back to you. Well, Jay, thank you very much. It was a wonderful session. Um, unpacked lots of things. Also left me with a question or two to ponder. Um, and so uh, we will look forward to seeing you back um, next week. Uh, those of you in the, um, in the course design in Canvas project, when you go online with to the Canvas course, you'll see uh, a lot of these concepts uh, and a chance for you to, to, to visit them yet again. So uh, again, Jay, thank you very much. And I will stop talking. And then uh, those who want to hang around and ask a question or, or whatever, feel free to do that.